Capital View, where we discuss the latest in state government and politics. I'm Hannah Meisel with NPR Illinois. Joining us this week is John Jackson, visiting professor of political science at Southern Illinois University's Paul Simon Public Policy Institute. Thanks for being here, John. I'm glad to be here. And also here is Jerry Nowicki of Capital News Illinois. Glad you're here, Jerry. Glad to be here as well. Well, the debate over masks in schools roars on despite Governor J.B. Pritzker's uh, mask mandate that he issued last week. A couple pieces of news. Uh, there's been a lawsuit filed over the mask mandate. Uh, the attorney, Tom DeVore, who rose to prominence among conservatives last year for challenging a bunch of the governor's uh, executive orders on mitigations for COVID. Uh, he, he's the one who, of course, filed the lawsuit on behalf of a father in Brees, which is about 40 miles east of St. Louis. Um, and this time, instead of claiming uh, the usual argument that the governor is not allowed to make consecutive disaster declarations, he's trying to go after the state's Emergency Management Agency Act and saying that the governor can't usurp local school districts uh, control of her decisions, uh, you know, pertaining to health and safety. Um, Jerry, you know, tell us a little bit more about this lawsuit and what do you expect the outcome might be? We have a hearing, I believe, uh, early next week. Yeah, I don't know what the outcome will be. It seems that Mr. DeVore's track rec record isn't exactly great with these cases. He had some success in Clay County temporarily, but I think it was a Sangamon County judge here in Springfield that have ended, ended up overturning. Uh, I, I honestly forget which of his lawsuits had success, but- um, There were a lot of lawsuits last year. Right, so he's challenged the indoor dining ban famously, and just now that now the mask mandate, and. It's, it's on behalf of the Breeze District, and there are a lot of rural districts. I, I used to cover rural districts, and I've kept in touch with some of the superintendents there on social media and otherwise, and they, you know, they get annoyed that the, what this is doing is taking it out of local control hands, which is, you know, one of the things that Mr. DeVore has always kind of uh, held as a centerpiece of his challenges as well. So uh, I know there's a lot of sort of animosity about it, but, you know, to predict how it'll go, you know, that, that's, that's just so dependent on the judge and a number of other factors. Right. That's, that's correct. I mean, in Illinois and lots of other states, but Illinois, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about venue shopping because Illinois is such a a stronghold for plaintiffs, lawyers, uh, trial lawyers. And so, um, you know, but, you know, Tom DeVore, it's worth mentioning, he, and, well, his most famous client uh, was uh, then state rep, now state senator, Darren Bailey, who was, of course, running for governor. Uh, and in that Clay County case that you mentioned, Gary, that was briefly successful, uh, you know, uh, Darren Bailey was the only person who was let out of uh, Governor Pritzker's stay-at-home orders uh, last year. And now Darren Bailey is running for governor, and Tom DeVore is running for a seat on the state's fourth district appellate court. Um, so, you know, no matter win or lose, it does seem designed to just get him more publicity. And, uh, you know, people would be very lucky to know, like, it would be very rare for, you know, any uh, random citizen to uh, necessarily know the names of who sits on their fourth district appellate court or even what the state's fourth district appellate court is and how it differs from other uh, jurisdictions. But, you know, he would definitely be the most famous name on that ballot possibly ever. Um, so, John, what do you, you know, the, these lawsuits, these never ending lawsuits that seem uh, designed more for publicity than anything. I mean, I saw a suggestion this week that perhaps that is unethical, uh, that maybe the Illinois State Bar Association or Trial Law Association should step in. Is that, you know, is that something that uh, those professional organizations should consider? Well, let me just put it briefly in the larger context. This fight's been going on a year and a half. It's continuing saga of COVID wars or uh, maybe mask wars. And uh, I think we've seen this movie before, and I think we know how it's going to turn out. 
uh, it was inevitable as soon as the governor issued his edict about the mask that there would be lawsuits filed and not surprisingly by this party. Uh, the governor is totally predictable on this stuff. He's following what he said he was going to do, what he said about the science and what he said about the guidance of the CDC. Uh, I call that sort of the democratic governor's model. Uh, Gavin Newsom in California being the most famous example. They've got the same fights going on out there. I did note with interest down here that Andy Bashir, the governor of Kentucky, this week followed J.B. Pritzker's model, and he will get some of the same kind of pushback in Kentucky. As you well know, the Republican model is epitomized by DeSantis uh, in Florida and Abbott in Texas, and they're saying that they won't let the school districts follow the federal guidelines. I think it's interesting to note that Texas and Florida are the epicenter of this resurgence, and they've got about 20, 25 percent of the cases in Florida, and the rest in uh, Texas mounts up to 40 percent of all the cases. It's also interesting to me that the two big school districts that are fighting back in those two states are the capital cities, Austin in the case of Texas, uh, and Tallahassee in the case of Florida. They're saying, we want local control, leave us alone. And of course, DeSantis particularly has been very aggressive about that. Uh, so this really is a continuation of national fight. Uh, and it's a fight that is very partisan and very polarized. Uh, I think this particular one will end the same way. The, as Jerry said, uh, the track record on challenging the governor's power is not good in court. The state has something very strong called the police power. It has the right to look after the safety, health, and welfare of its citizens. And there's something called Dillon's Rule, which says uh, the cities have to follow along with what the state says ultimately. So I'm not a lawyer, but I expect the lawyers will be trotting out some of that kind of thing. So I don't think this is going anywhere with the possible exception of getting uh, the two players that you mentioned, some really sizable free publicity. Yeah, that's a good point on the state's police powers. Um, you know, those are pretty powerful. I feel like the last time I saw those fail was in the pension debate, uh, you know, six years ago in front of the Illinois Supreme Court. But, you know, mentioning the other Republican governors, I did think it was interesting last week when Arkansas's Republican governor, Asa Hutchinson, said he actually regretted signing the, yeah. uh, you know, it, we ha it's the opposite world of Illinois where, um, you know, he signed a law that forbids local school districts to do mask mandates. Uh, that's what the hyper partisan state legislature in Arkansas sent him, sent him to his desk in the spring when cases were going down to be fair. Um, but, you know, along comes this uh, Delta variant, which is more transmissible, uh, possibly more virulent. And, uh, you know, we're seeing Arkansas as among those states where, um, you know, cases are unfortunately going up again, and uh, even more unfortunately, pediatric ICUs are getting full. Um, yeah. but, uh, Jerry, I'm, I'm from Arkansas, so I know a lot about that case. Let me just comment quickly, and that is, Asa Hutchinson's been sort of on the on the knife edge about this. He did sign the law, then he later publicly regretted it, called the legislature back in session. They refused to repeal the law, so the fight goes on. Right, right. I didn't know you are from Arkansas. Uh, uh, <laughs> now the viewers know that too. Um, Jerry, the Illinois State Board of Education, though, uh, they are not messing around. They told, uh, so over on Wednesday morning, a the superintendent for a private Christian school uh, up in Elmhurst, in the Chicago suburb of Elmhurst, uh, said in a video that went live uh, that he would not enforce uh, Governor Pritzker's mask mandate within a school, his uh, pre-K through 12, 1200 student school. Uh, and you know, apparently he and the state superintendent uh, spoke uh, all day Wednesday and uh, by Wednesday evening, uh, less than 12 hours after that video went up, uh, the state superintendent, Carmen Ayala, told him that uh, 
his school had been stripped of recognition status by ISB. And that is a really big deal. It's very rare move, really big deal. It means that among other things, the school will not be able to uh, participate in a state scholarship program. Um, and uh, students cannot compete in uh, elementary or high school sports or activities, but even more critically means that seniors who graduate from that school, um, you know, their diploma would not be recognized by ISB. Uh, now the school has 14 days to appeal and then there'll be a hearing, but Jerry, what kind of message is the State Board of Education sending here? It's a pretty powerful one. I think it's probably easier for a private school like that to challenge than it would be for a public school, um, to challenge the authority that is to, to take the risks that the district is obviously taking right now, um, just because of the fewer resources you get as a private school. But in terms of the message, I mean, Isby, doesn't want to mess around with it. I think it, and it's a pretty wide divergence from where they were, I think in mid July, I think you and I were working on similar stories when they were saying, you know, it's, they should be doing masks. We're not looking at recognition as an enforcement measure at this time, but it shows you how quickly the Delta variant has kind of taken hold and sent hospitalizations skyrocketing for all age groups, as you know. Um, so in terms of, what the response does from ISB. I think in some of the districts I covered um, that fact about sports, for better or worse, that would be one of the driving factors that would cause the administration to sort of rethink what it did, because if they were, took an action uh, one way or another that prevented their students from being able to participate in sports, there'd be a lot of blowback um, on that. Uh, so. You know, it'll be interesting to see what, how that appeal turns out. I don't know anything about that process. Maybe you have more inform information as to who, who it's an appeal to, or is there a type of panel that hears it? I'm not 100% sure, but uh, it'll be interesting to watch that process. Because it's so rare, I, you know, never encountered it before in eight years covering state government. Um, but, you know, I assume it's an appeal to the Board of Education itself, and there's going to be some sort of hearing. But John, we were talking uh, before we hit uh, record on this program, and you've been in higher education basically your entire career. Um, and, you know, you had some thoughts on what uh, graduating with a diploma that is not recognized by the State Board of Education might mean for students. Well, there are some disadvantages in some places, depends on the university that you might be trying to get into as opposed to another one or a community college or the differences really range across the broad spectrum of American higher education. It is a disadvantage that follows the student around. Uh, they can probably get in uh, if they've got exceptional test scores and good grades and all of that. Uh, but it's not good for the students. I do want to add a follow-up to something Jerry said, though, and that is to note that is being taking this heavy-handed, some would say, stance and uh, doing, not surprisingly, what the governor said that they, they would be doing, so it's not surprising what Isby's doing, but that in tandem with what the governor has done, it seems to me really takes a lot of heat off these local school districts and superintendents and principals who are really between a rock and a hard place because the state has spoken and the school boards and, <clears throat> and the superintendents, they're going to say in the public schools, look, we've got to follow what the governor says and what Isby says. I haven't seen but one or two small articles about these really heated local school board meetings where people demonstrated, people got up and got angry at one another, cops had to be called. That's going on routinely in Florida and Texas. I think uh, all of these people at that level will probably be quietly thanking the governor and Isby for taking the heat off of them in the public sector. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Um... You know, it's definitely a huge trend in uh, other states. I saw a video last night from yeah. Tennessee, and it was 
just insane. But you know, there have been fights here, especially up in the uh, Chicago suburbs. There have been ones where police had to be called. But uh, you know, perhaps uh, folks are conflating what's happening somewhere else with what's happening locally. But nevertheless, you're right. You know, it definitely takes a lot of pressure off those local school boards to not have to decide and just say, "Well, we're going with the governor's mandate." But um, I do want to move on um to uh, an update on the frontline state worker vaccine mandate um you know as we discussed on the program last week the uh, frontline state workers people who work in prisons um you know facility mental health uh facilities congregate care uh, living veterans homes uh they are you know within this a vaccine mandate and the union that represents them, the state's largest public sector employee union is uh, AFSCME and they are still pretty upset about it, though they did leave the door open to bargaining on the issue. Um, you know, I asked the governor the other day if he'd be willing to model his, or, you know, amend his uh, uh, executive order to kind of model President Biden's order on federal employees uh, and contractors. And, you know, in that case, people are able to give uh, exemptions uh, for, you know, religious reasons and submit to regular testing and said, but the governor said, no, these are folks in 24 seven employees who are serving the most vulnerable. And, you know, uh, like he noted last week, a lot of these facilities have pretty low vaccination rates uh, and, you know, even if their residents have pretty high vaccination rates. And the other thing he did was end uh, COVID sick time, which of course asked me is also up in arms about. But uh, Jerry, um, you know, when we, uh, before October 4th, when this is supposed to go into effect, what do you think we might see happen? Do you think that there will be a, uh, Good faith bargaining process was asked me, or uh, is is this just going to go to into effect as an edict, and we'll see what happens with the workers who refuse? Yeah, that's that's a good question. I think there's a little bit of a strained relationship between some of the unions and the governor. Um, you know, in, in as much as unions strain their relationship with Democrats, but uh, I think what the governor is going to have to decide is that you know, what kind of example does he want to set for businesses across the state? If he carves out too many exceptions on this, businesses might say, well, the governor's letting all these state workers get away with it, whatever. Um, so I don't, I don't know how that'll work. And the other thing that's kind of interesting to watch is whether it'll be sort of full approval uh, from the FDA at any point for the vaccines rather than emergency use authorization. I know Dr. Fauci had sort of said recently that made national news that you're going to see a whole slew of, of businesses or whoever mandating vaccines uh, once it's, it's out of the emergency youth, uh, use authorization process. So I don't know if that's going to play in the state's decision, but I think the governor will be certainly um, cognizant of what kind of example he's setting. Sure. And you know, we also have schools, obviously, we just spent a long time talking about schools. Um, teacher vaccine mandates up until the other day were kind of just a theoretical possibility. Um, but then California went and uh, said, you know, they laid down the gauntlet and said, we're going to be the first state to mandate that teachers get the vaccine. John, do you think that puts pressure on other blue states to follow suit? I know that, you know, when I asked the uh, well, first of all, the American Teacher Federation uh, president, Randy Weingarten, who is uh, definitely famous in political circles, she over the weekend came out in favor of vaccine mandates. And when I asked the uh, Illinois Education Association president, Kathy Griffin, the other day, she said, you know, she's not necessarily opposed. She just wants them uh, to be bargained with individual districts and their local school boards. So do you think that those things mean that it might be coming to other blue states, including Illinois? Yes, I absolutely do. This is a case of uh, don't do what I say, do what I do. And 
people are looking to these educational leaders for leadership on this question. I've watched the national and tried to watch the state scene pretty carefully on this. And the constant theme that is dominant uh, is that these teachers say they want to protect the kids and they want to follow uh, the most safe route. And all of the custodial people up through the principal and superintendent have a role in that. And I think that's been the predominant, although there are exceptions, uh, drift of all of the information I can gather, the interviews I've seen and so forth. Uh, and I think the blue state governors will uh, sort of follow Joe Biden's example on what he said to the armed forces ultimately, because uh, that's a pretty strong statement. And I think they are likely to copy that. I think this governor has particular motivation because He's got the LaSalle Veterans Home thing hanging over his head, and it'll be an issue. And he wants to have some good retorts uh, when both the Republicans and the reporters come after him. No, that's a really good point. And in fact, uh, you know, that was what he used as an example last week to point out the delta between uh, you know, 99, 100% of res uh, residents vaccinated and some of those. Uh, veterans' homes versus really low vaccination rates among staff. Um, but yeah, I mean, Jerry, uh, the superintendents that you keep in touch with, I mean, would they necessarily fight uh, against a vaccine mandate too, uh, you know, in order to avoid a bargaining session with their locals? Yeah, I hadn't really touched on that, but I, I think it's, as John had kind of said earlier, that there'd probably be a lot of relief if it if it took that bargaining situation out of the hands of the local districts uh, and they were just able to say, you know, this is something that the state is requiring us to do. We don't have much choice in the matter. Um, but there is also that sort of local control streak that these districts are very proud of and they're proud of their communities and you know they want to be able to set their policies as well so i mean it, it is always a sort of kind of a tightrope walk in that regard but uh i think there might be a little relief there um if the state makes that decision and uh just with a couple minutes left here, John, I want to get in uh, one more subject. The U.S. Senate this week, uh, very active. They finally uh, passed a half a trillion dollar uh, uh, transportation infrastructure bill, uh, which has been in negotiations for many, many weeks. Uh, that includes, uh, you know, a lot of money for Illinois. Uh, you know, federal highway aid, broadband, public transit, electric vehicles, and also, uh, you know, getting lead out of the water. Illinois is apparently the state with the most lead pipes in the whole nation. But, uh, you know, this isn't a complete done deal. Uh, it has to go through the U.S. House and progressives there want to get the other things that they had wanted, uh, these like kind of public social programs through uh budget reconciliation. So what do you think we'll see there in Washington? Well, this is huge for state and local governments. I think you'll see a good deal of pressure on some of those Republicans in these congressional districts because uh, they know that there's a lot of money there for all kinds of things that are very popular in their districts, even if they're as rural and red as they come, uh, they want to be there cutting those ribbons. Uh, I think that same pressure will come to bear on the House. I think probably Pelosi will hold her coalition together and this thing uh, will pass. And uh, then, of course, they'll move right along to the so-called human services uh, infrastructure, uh, which is going to be an e even tighter squeeze, but probably doable, maybe doable. Yes, we'll see. And, you know, Jerry, one of the things that we knew would probably come out of this was money to keep nuclear plants open. But Exelon has already said that that money wouldn't uh, keep them from closing the plants that they'd already identified uh, that would be shuttered this fall. And, uh, you know, we know that 
we might be called back to Springfield later this month in August. Um, you know, any movement there? Yeah, the interesting thing about that, uh, I think, is the, at least the way I understand it, is if the state gives aid, it would detract, it would take away some of the federal aid available. So even if there is federal aid, I guess every dollar of the state would decrease that amount and it would not not take away the amount, not take away from the amount of aid the state would have to give to satisfy the nuclear plants. Kind of an impossible situation we find ourselves in, but uh, we'll see how it plays out. I want to thank my guests, John Jackson, Jerry Nowicki. Uh, thanks for watching Capital View, and we'll catch you again next time.